Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Campbell speaking and welcome to Functions for College Math. So in this particular course, you are going to be learning about several different kinds of functions, functions like exponential functions, linear functions, sinusoidal functions, logarithmic functions, all of the functions that are needed for a college algebra course. And today we're going to start with our first lesson, which is just generically, what is a function? So what I have for you is a lesson template that you'll have for every lesson and with that some homework assignment um, that you will be doing and uploading to Canvas. And we'll talk more about that after we complete our first one. This little space right here is for the date. And I don't know what the date is for you. It's going to be different for each cohort. So if you are in cohort A, this would be January 4th, I believe. No, sorry, it will not. It'll be January 25th? No, 21st, maybe? So whatever date it is, I don't know. Just write down your date so you can kind of keep things in order. And we begin with what does it mean to be a function? So what I write down, I expect that you write down as well. So these are going to be your notes that you keep and study from. You will always want to have a calculator and sometimes you're going to get these lessons in class and sometimes you'll get them as a podcast such as this one. So you're going to want to, if you're doing this via podcast, you're going to want to listen and take notes just as if you were in class. And when I ask questions, you want to answer those questions as well, whether it's just in your head or out loud. So as we begin, what is a function? Well, we start with the definition for a relation. A relation is a rule which ties two sets together. And that rule can be displayed in several different ways as we're going to see down here. It says, um, when we go down a little further, different ways to represent relations. This first one is called a mapping. And we display how they're connected with arrows. The second one is a table and we display how they're connected by position in the table. These guys go together, these guys go together, and so on. We can also look at a graph, and we can also look at an equation. And all of those are going to represent relations or functions. So let's take a look at what does it mean to be a function. Those are all relations. A function is a special relation where every input, which are typically the x's, have exactly one output, which are the y values. So a special relation where every input has, have, ooh, has, ooh, bad grammar, not a fan. Let's erase that. Has. Yeah. Every relation, a special relation where every input has exactly one output. So, for example, I have here two um, concession stands represented. So, if you were working at concession stand number one, and I came up to you and I said, I would like a hot dog, you'd say $2. So, I give you my input of hot dog, you give me the output of $2. If I say I'd like popcorn, you'd say 50 cents. If I say I'd like soda, you'd say 75 cents. If I say I'd like candy, you'd say 50 cents. So every time I give you an input, that's what these are, these are the inputs, you respond with a simple output. And that is exactly what is a function. So let's go to concession stand number two. If I came to concession number two and you were working, I'd say I'd like a hot dog and you'd say $2. I'd say I like popcorn, you'd say 50 cents. I'd say I like soda, and you'd say which size. The fact that you have which size here means that this one input right here results in two separate outputs. This is not a function. So when you're thinking, wow, function, yeah, that's right. When you're thinking about what a function is, please go back to the concession stand idea and think about if I come to your concession stand, are you going to give me more than one output? So, and below, I have here now um, eight different representations, and your job is going to be to figure out if it's a function or not. So, please take a look at the first three examples. Those are all mapping diagrams, and so much like the concession stand, 
For example, if I come to number one, your concession stand, and I say, I like the number one, you'd say, that's a dollar. I'd say, number two, you'd say, that's zero, it's free. And number three, you'd say, that's four dollars. This is an example of something that is a function. Now, let's go to concession stand number two and three. I'm going to give you a hint. One of them is a function, and one of them is not. Your job right now, tell me which one is not a function. Did you decide? If you said number three is not a function, you would be correct because the input of two results in two different outputs, a five or a seven. So I'd say I would like the number two and you'd say which size, right? So you want the small or the large, the $5 one or the $7 one. That's not a function. Now contrast that with number two. I say the number one, you say $2. I'd say number two, you'd say $2. I'd say number three, you'd say $2. That's like the $2 store, the $2 tree. Um, this one is a function. Even though you give me the same one every time, it's how many outputs you give me that tells me whether it's a function or not. All right, let's go on to the next representation, which is a table. In the table situation that we have, um, again, I'm going to say these are my inputs, so I'm going to come to your table and I'm going to say I'd like the number one and you're going to say $10 for, for question number four. I'd say I'd like the number two, you'd say $9 and so on. So take a look at examples four and five. One of them is a function and one of them is not. Can you tell me which one is not? So this is a point at which I said that when I ask you a question, I want you to answer it, at least in your head. So did you answer it in your head? All right, did you say number five is not a function? If you did, you would be correct. Number five is not a function because the number two results in two different outputs. It's like two gets mapped to both eight and to zero. If I look at number four, each x value, one, two, three, and four, gets mapped to a different y value and only one y value, which is the idea here, so this one is a function. All right, now we're gonna move on to six, seven, and eight. These are graphs, which is our third representation. In the three graphs that we have here, you wanna be thinking about the x's and the y's. Let me just start with number six with you. If I were to give you an x value, say x values, remember on the x-axis, that's right here. Say I give you this x value. Does it have a y value? Well, sure it does. It has one up here, but it has another one down here. For example, this might be the point one comma two. This one might be the point one comma negative two. Can you see how that x value results in two different y values? This is an example that is something, whoops, sorry, I hit a button here, that is not a function. So number six is not a function. Okay, take a look at seven and eight. What do you think about those? Did you think seven was a function? What about eight? There is a little rule that we often remember with graphs that helps us to determine if something is a function or not. Before I answer yes, yes or no to seven and eight, let's go to our right side of our page and let's write down what that rule is. This rule only works for graphs. Right here, let me just switch colors so you can see it. Sometimes I struggle here. You'll learn that soon enough. All right, that vertical line crosses through the circle in two different places. That means that x value, one, has two different y values, two and negative two. It is not a function. So if we move on to seven, did you already have a guess about that? Well, let's try to draw a vertical line that crosses more than once. Here's one, here's two, here's three, four. Oh goodness, it seems like I can do this all day long and never cross more than once. This is an example of something that is a function. Now, eight is a little tricky because I didn't really give you all the information that you need. The graph of this is something called a hyperbola. And it is a parent function, or it is a function that we are going to be learning about this year. And what it has is something called a vertical asymptote. And it's a vertical line that kind of splits these two into parts. Neither one of those ever crosses that line. That's what happens with asymptotes. Um, so we just look at the rest of the graph. Um, it does not cross here, it does not overlap, and so vertical line, vertical line all day long. And when you get to here, the graph is really steep and it almost looks like a vertical line crosses it, like the whole thing, but it doesn't. This is a special kind of function, and yes, it is a function. All right, so once we've determined whether something is a function or not, then the next idea that comes up, it goes like this. A graph represents a function if it 
passes the, and I'm going to write here VLT. Can you remember what that stands for? You're right if you remembered vertical line test. I'm going to write down what that is. The vertical line test The vertical line test says this. If a vertical line, that's a straight up and down one, oh, line, doesn't need to be plural, passes through the graph more than once, then it is not a function. So the vertical line test kind of helps us to determine if something is not a function, with the idea being if it passes through more than one time, that means that particular x value has more than one y value. So for example, and I'm going to go back to my graph right now, if I drew a vertical line, is function notation. So it turns out that in math, with functions and equations and in science, and darn it, I did not see that grid was weird on the bottom, um, hopefully yours is not. Um, when I look at f of x, that's how that's read. So I'm going to write that down first of all. The function notation f parentheses x is read f of x. And this is important to know because sometimes people think parentheses means multiply, but we are not multiplying f by x. What it means is that the function's name is f, and it also means that x is the independent variable. So it's just a way of naming a function. Otherwise, um, it's really just another name for y. And so why do we call it f of x and why not just call it y? Because they actually mean exactly the same thing. Well, sometimes we're working with more than one function. For example, in the problems coming up, you see that we'll have a function called g and another one called h and another one called m. And we have to know which one we're using. If we called them all y, then how would we know? So that's how we, we want to use a name that represents the function. Then when we say f of 2, and that's how we read that, that means find y when x is 2. That's a shortcut way of saying find y when x is 2. So when we look at the examples that we have at the bottom, g of 4 means when x is 4, go to the function called g and find the value of y. That's a lot of words. And lots of algebra is about taking lots of words and shortcutting the notation. So g of 4 is going to equal, go to the, the function called g and replace all of the x's with 4's. That would be negative 3 times 4 minus 1. And of course with PEMDAS, you remember PEMDAS, right? I'll write it right here, really tiny. We have to follow the order of operations. PEMDAS, PEMDAS, however you say it. Um, which is, in this case we don't have any exponents. Well, we have parentheses, but there's nothing to do inside the parentheses. And then there's multiplication. I'll do that first. So negative 3 times 4 is negative 12. And then I still have that minus 1 to do. And then there's subtraction. It's the very last thing. And so we get an answer of negative 13. So that would tell me that if I were looking at the function g of x, and maybe I want to graph it, for example, when x is 4, y is negative 13. That's what that value is. The next one says g of negative 6. I'll put that in. So going to the same equation, because it's, again, asking for g. So I'll do g of negative 6 is negative 3 times negative 6 minus 1. Well, a negative times a negative is a positive. Do that subtraction, you get 17. Now as we move on to the next question, the next one refers to the function called j. So now i got to find the j, and again, that's why we use function notation. j of 5 is 3 times 5 squared, because I'm replacing the m with a 5m, the independent variable here, plus 2 times 5. Now I do have exponents, so I have to do that first. 5 squared is 25. Notice I just square the 5, not the 3. Then I'll do the multiplications from left to right. That's 75 plus 10, which would give us the addition. Last thing, 85 it is. 
All right, now I'm gonna ask you to hit the pause button right now, and I'd like you to do the next two questions on your own. So please hit pause, do the questions on your own, then we'll come back together and see how we did. You ready, set, go. All right, let's see how we all did. So H of seven was the first one. Did you realize you had to go to a different function for that one? I hope so. Let's see, so if I go to the H, this one's the H. I'm gonna replace A, that's our independent variable this time with seven. That would give me seven plus one in parentheses squared minus, gotta replace all of the A's, and we put a seven in here. Then we do have parentheses. We didn't have that before, so we're thinking about that PEMDAS thing again. Parentheses, seven plus one. Then exponents, eight squared is 64. Then subtract, this would be a good time for a calculator if you needed one. 57, I believe, is the answer. Did you get 57? Pat yourself on the back if you did. Good job, guys. Let's go on to the next one, J of negative one. So J of negative one, ready? I'm gonna switch color here so we don't get confused by my work. Going to the function J, you already did it. Let's see if you got the same thing I do. Three times negative one squared plus two times negative one. Let's see, square first. Negative one times negative one is just one. And then the next thing we'll do is those multiplications, three plus negative two, I'm thinking we're gonna get a one. All right, what'd you do? Did you get one? Great. Now, as you look at my thing, sometimes when I make this, um, I had to make this into a PDF in order to use the program that I'm using here, and it made the graph goofy. Yours should not look goofy, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna add a couple of points on here so we can kind of analyze it together since I don't longer have the grid, the grid somehow is floating up here. A couple of points that I would want you to notice, and they're gonna be the same points that are on yours. I'm gonna highlight mine in red here so you can see them. This ending point looks to me to be like negative three, negative one. That's this point. My grid is gone, yours should still be there. This point here is negative one, negative four. To the left, one and down four, do you agree with me? Sorry, that's my kind of screw up here. The y-intercept on this looks like zero, negative three. This turning point here looks like one, oh, excuse me, two to the right and one up. And I don't think we need any other ones, so I'll just use those to, to figure out what these values are. So a little tricky from a graph, but actually really easy once you kind of know what you're doing. The first one says K of two. So remember when you're doing a graph, X is the first number, Y is the second. So these are all X's followed by Y's. And when I put the number in parentheses for the function K of X, I'm replacing X with two, and I'm saying, well, what's Y? So if X is two, what's Y? Well, that's this point right here. If x is two, y is one, boom, done. That's all there is to that. Next one says k of negative one. That says what's y when x is negative one? So I'm gonna go to the negative one. That's right here, guys. What's y? Oh, it's the negative four that goes with it. Okay, will you answer the next two, please? All right, k of zero is the next one that comes up. At k of zero, that's this point right here. The y value is negative three. Good, I hope you got that one right. And then k of negative four, now that was kind of a weird one, right? Did you look at go, I don't know, it doesn't look like there is an x at negative four. And you are right, there isn't one. And when that doesn't happen, we say that the function is undefined at that value. There is no y value at that point. So with this all kind of in mind, um, that's looking at the graphs. We are now going to introduce a new kind of function today called a piecewise function. This, however, is sort of an introduction to what's coming in our next lesson. All right, one new thing today. The new thing is a new type of function. It's a piecewise function. So um, have you ever been to a restaurant like Asia Palace or Jade Garden or Old Country Buffet? I think they just closed, I think. Um, but those are all different restaurants where they charge kind of in a different way. Now, normally you go to a restaurant and you get a re uh, menu and you look at it and you go, you know, I'll have the steak or whatever and they'll go $12.99. Or I'll have a hamburger and it'll be $8.99 or whatever it happens to be. But there are these other kinds of places, they're buffet kind of restaurants where you pay one price and you can eat as much as you want at that buffet. It's not based on how much you eat, it is based on how old you are. Have you ever been to one like that? Really, it makes kind of sense because if you think about it, we're wondering how much each person is going to pay at this particular breakfast or brunch. 
a first grader and Mrs. Campbell, a first grader is like six years old and Mrs. Campbell's like not six years old, um, we are definitely not eating the same quantity of food. So first graders should probably pay less. And then there's President Trump. President Trump and I probably also don't because President Trump is a senior citizen. And senior citizens tend to not eat very much food. So they should pay less. Or it's kind of a nice way to say, come on in. We want you to have a, a good price here because you're a senior citizen. Not that President Trump can't afford more, but it's kind of a gift that we give to our seniors. So for this particular function, the cost is going to vary based on their age. This part of the function right here is what defines the age. This part right here represents their cost. So this is called the cost of the function in terms of x, where x is their age. So if I wanted to know the cost of a first grader, first graders are about six years old, so I'd say the cost of a six-year-old, it would be, well, I have to figure out which category they fit in, category one, two, or three. Well, they fit into category one, because six is less than or equal to 10. So their cost would be 50 cents times their six years of age, which means they pay $3, half of six. Mrs. Campbell just had a birthday and turned 57 years old. For those of you that haven't met me, yes, I'm old. I am not a senior citizen, however, I am only between the ages of 10 and 62. So my charge is going to be this. And you'll notice it doesn't have an X value at all, which means I pay 950. So here's the deal. You go there, you pay 950 as well. I pay 950. And lots of people, most ages, pay 950. Only the young people and the older people, they're the ones that get a break. So President Trump, gosh, I wish I knew how old he was. I want to say, I want to say he's 74. I don't know for sure though. Um, let's just pretend he's 74. I kind of think he is. I think he's 74. I think uh, President or President-elect Biden, President-elect I say now, depending on when you get to this, that probably isn't President-elect anymore, and President Trump is probably former President Trump, because um, I don't think he'll do this until after the inauguration. So the cost of a 74-year-old, well, 74 is more than 62, so it would be $6.50 they get that senior discount. All right, final question, this one, no context associated with it. Just wanted you to understand that's kind of how these types of functions work. In our last example today, this is also a piecewise function. That's called that, by the way, because it's made up of pieces. This one has two pieces. The one before had three pieces, but both of them are dependent on their age or on their age or on their X value. So when I say F of negative five, as in that first example, I got to figure out what category that is in. So is negative five less than negative four or is negative five greater than or equal to negative four? So if you picture on a number line, here's where the negative four is. Negative five is over here. It's on the left hand side of it. So it's less than that. That means I use the first category. So the first category says two negative five minus one in absolute value. Do you remember what that means? Now let's deal with it in a second. Inside this, this is like a big set of parentheses, so we'll work inside the parentheses. Two times negative five is negative 10 minus one. Inside the parentheses is negative 11. And the absolute value of any number, whether it's positive or negative, will be a positive number. So the absolute value of negative 11 is just plain old 11. The absolute value of three would just be plain old three. The absolute value just takes your whatever number you have and makes it positive. For the next one, f of 10, we look again at the categories. Here are the categories. Is 10 less than negative four or is it greater than or equal to negative four? Well, it's way over here on the right-hand side of negative four. It is obviously greater than that. So when I'm gonna use that second one, which says three and then 10 squared, and now I do have to think about order of operations. I square before I multiply. 10 squared is 100. 100 times three is 300. All right, the last one's all yours, guys. Take a second and try that last one. All right, I hope you did it. First thing you have to decide is where it fits in. Is negative four less than a negative four or is it greater than or equal to negative four? And here's that equal sign. Negative four is equal in this category, which means this is the one I'm gonna use. So I'm gonna plug that one in. That would give me 
3 times negative 4 squared. Remember, you square first, and a negative times a negative is a positive. That gives me 3 times 16, which is 48. Now, guys, I didn't use a calculator at all today, but if you needed to, no problem. I mean, you have a calculator, and if you don't have one, then we'll need to talk real soon here, and we'll try to get you one from the library. Just let me know. Alrighty, have a good day, everybody, and there's some homework to practice with, and we'll see you next time.